I can see this is um, my husband's and my um, first attendance at the Orange County Astronomer um, meeting, and I can see that you have having really a lot of fun here. So I can see well everybody was, why everybody was so excited that I was going to be here, that I told today. So I am thrilled to be here. Um, I felt quite sure that most people today would have a working knowledge of telescopes that were here. I also felt reasonably sure that everyone here might have a working knowledge of the uh, Star Trek universe. So I felt reasonably secure in, in comparing my lifelong journey through space and through time to some of the things that have happened in the Star Trek universe. Um, I think that we would consider the people, the characters that we followed in Star Trek who were part of Starfleet to have had amazing lives. And I have had an amazing life. Um, but as you know from exploring the universe through telescopes, that it is indeed, um, exploration is not easy. It is not easy. It does not come easy. And indeed, there is always more than meets the eye. A good example um, from Star Trek, for example, is from the episode of the original series, Journey to, to Babel. Dr. McCoy questions Spock's mother, Amanda. And he asks if Spock ever ran and played on Vulcan when he was a little boy, like a human child might have done. And um, she indeed responds that Spock had a pet, sort of like a teddy bear. And um, Bones immediately begins to tease Spock and to say, oh my goodness, you had a teddy bear when you were a little boy. And that teasing is very short-lived because Spock happens to comment that his teddy bear was alive and had six-inch fangs. And I have never seen a teddy bear like that, and I hope that I never do. But I will make the case in the presentation today that while exploration on the front lines is never easy, that it is always, always worthwhile. My love of astronomy didn't start with Star Trek for me, but the original Star Trek series and the Star Trek movie in 2009 indeed became a focus of my life. Why do we explore? Make sure that I can know how, okay. We call, what calls us to look up in the night sky and to wonder what is out there in space? I believe there is something in us fundamentally that makes us want to know what is about the universe in which we find ourselves and our place within it. Children are always an indicator of our original and fundamental loves in life. And I'm thrilled to see how much outreach that you do in this club for children. Um, I have never been to a talk in an elementary school where hands were not left high in the air with questions still waiting to be answered and there's no time. There's not enough time to answer all the questions that children have about our universe. And fundamentally, I think that tells us that we care about the universe. And how could we not care about objects such as these, Saturn, in a near infrared from the spacecraft Cassini's visual and infrared mapping spectrometer. A world with aurora, a world with lightning, with storms, with the rings, and indeed with a plethora of moons, a mini solar system. Our own moon and the planet Mars captured beyond it both in the waning gibbous phase. How can we not care about our star, the sun, from SDO? How can we not care about those erupting um, massive prominences on it. How can we not care about young massive stars in the Eagle Nebula recently shown to us by Hubble with the dark patches, as you, I'm sure you all know, the extremely dark patches, and it's very hard to see in this light. They're so dark I can't see them. But where there are missing stars, indeed, those are dark nebula. They obscure and absorb the light from beyond them, and within them, stars are being born. How can we not care about globular clusters like NGC 1806 from Hubble in the, um, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which interestingly enough, they're saying now it is a galaxy. It is passing by us, but they are saying it will not collide with the Milky Way. That is new information. That's exciting. 
Okay, how can we not care about the Rosette molecular cloud and nebula pictured by ESA's Herschel spacecraft in the infrared, or M51, so familiar to us, whose spiral arm is altered by a companion galaxy, and indeed, it is not in physical contact with that companion galaxy, as I'm sure that, that most of you or many of you realize now indeed. How can we not care about a massive spiral Andromeda that we saw earlier? This pictured um, by Weiss in the infrared, now believed to have been in an impact with another galaxy producing, producing that, uh, that encircled um, line of dust and gas from that collision that do not follow the spiral arms. How can we not care about the Sombrero galaxy also, the result of the collision? The spiral, the, the spiral structure itself is warped. Indeed, the bulbous core um, is the form of which is undoubtedly due as well to an impact pictured by Spitzer in the infrared light, an impact with another galaxy. Here's an irregular galaxy such as the one discovered by Zwicky himself, obviously experiencing some kind of rebirth interaction with another galaxy. It's an extremely old galaxy, irregular in shape because of that interaction, and now birthing new stars after 12 billion years. How can we not care about images like the Cartwheel galaxy that we're seeing in a composite um, from Chandra X-ray, Galaxy Evolution Explorer, um, in the ultraviolet, the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, in the visual, and Spitzer in the infrared, and indeed a direct hit from one of the two galaxies pictured here, and they don't know exactly which to create that rare ring structure. How can we not care about dead or dying stars, such as the cat's eye planetary nebula, and our own sun will one day die, and indeed become a planetary nebula when it does this surrounded by the halo that we, that very many of the planetary nebula do indeed have. How can we not care indeed about a more massive star in the Crab Nebula that we talked about, that was talked about earlier, M1, forming this pulsar or neutron star when it died, leaving an enormous supernova remnant behind. This image is from the combined data of the great telescope Chandra, Spitzer, and Hubble. And the pulsar has been in the news lately for having charged particles accelerate at a much higher rate, much closer to the speed of light along um, magnetic field lines, producing a flare for something we thought was exceptionally stable and is indeed now something that we know varies in its intensity um, in that supernova remnant. How could we not care about Eta Carina, a star so massive that it will likely explode within a million years and quite possibly form a black hole when it does. Or indeed, the antenna galaxies, the nearest to us, and the youngest colliding galaxies in a composite image from Spitzer, from Hubble, and Chandra. And indeed, Centaurus A from Chandra, an elliptical galaxy which has recently collided with a spiral. What is shown is jets emerging from twisted magnetic field lines from an accretion disk around a supermassive black hole at its core. Indeed, can you imagine traveling toward the center of our galaxy as viewed by the great telescope Chandra, Hubble, and Spitzer in a starship? How could we not care about these objects, how they came to be, how we came to be in this vast expanse that captivates us at every turn, our universe, perhaps one of many universes. How can we not wonder that when we look out into space, is there someone or something looking back at us, wondering too what is out there in space? I believe there is a lot of truth in, in having a perspective like that. As an astronomer, it is, in my opinion, it conveys to us that we are what is out there in space, what we learn about the universe we learn about ourselves. In 1966, I watched my first episode of the Star Trek original series in my last year of junior high, what would be considered high school now, a freshman, and I eventually saw all the characters that brought uh, Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future to life, a place 
and time of peaceful exploration. The, um, to explore strange new worlds as we all hear at the beginning of the series. To seek out new life and new civilizations to boldly go where no man has gone before. The characters were commanding officer Captain James Kirk, as you will recall, captain of the Starship Enterprise, his first officer and science officer Spock, Spock a Vulcan, chief medical officer Leonard McCoy, otherwise known as Bones, chief engineer Scotty, um, communication officer Uhura, if you'll recall, helmsman lieutenant um, Sulu and navigator, security officer Ensign Pavel Andreevich Chekhov. For years as a child, I had already imagined each and every day as an exploration of a particular planet. It just happened to be Earth that I was on. It was easy to imagine, however, that every new vista or place of outdoor beauty was a place that had not been visited before, except by explorers such as myself, or myself and my family, since as a young child I went most places with my family. I had a love for exploration that be began when I did, it seemed. I wanted to become an astronaut and to make new discoveries in space. And that is indeed uh, pictured from the International Space Station, um, Twittered back to Earth, of the Earth. This is not to say that I did not do things or other things or think about other things as a child. I had tea parties with my dolls and stuffed animals. I loved and adored my brother. I had two parents I loved, but I was fundamentally a really little kid, as you can probably tell, who always loved astronomy. There was a world that a person would enter if they became an explorer. Star Trek defined it for me. It was first the Starfleet Academy, of course. That's where you would go for your education. Ultimately, one would be assigned to a starship like the Enterprise to begin exploration, but it all began by being a scientist and that is where my interest took me. Nothing mattered to me growing up as much as astronomy. I was fortunate to interpret my love of science broadly. If one goes to Starfleet Academy, certainly every talent a person has should be put to use. So for me, school, every aspect of my basic education from high school on and perhaps long before that, became an area in which to develop expertise. My family moved from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada to the United States in 1961. In Canada, sophisticated concepts began in kindergarten, but the first school I attended was in Hollywood, and it was light years behind where my brother and I were with our Canadian education at that point. But indeed, then we came to Pasadena and an elementary school called McKinley. There, right next to the Board of Education, experimental programs were being developed. One could pass right through the special doors of McKinley Elementary, right through to the halls of the Board of Education, where they were creating programs that I very much wanted to be a part of. The first thing the school did, and that's me in, down there in the corner. Oh, I've got my corner here. Okay, that's me right there. The first thing the school did was test me and determine that I was what they said gifted. The next thing they did was put me ahead an entire year within a month of my arrival there, despite the fact that I had started school at the age of four in Canada. So that put me two years ahead of my peers throughout. I looked like the younger sibling of all my classmates, and this young lady was the reason for my entire um, education from that point on. The school principal refused to skip me. She said that I would be completely out of place for the rest of my, um, my education, but then my teacher told her that my best friend was the tallest girl in the school. And that's Becky right there, and she is the reason that I was able to be put ahead. I never looked back. I did every assignment as though it were the Kobayashi Maru which is a Starfleet training exercise designed to test the character of cadets in command track at Starfleet Academy. I learned about humanitarianism. I learned about history. I learned about writing. I learned about deductive reasoning. And I learned about mathematics. And I loved it. 
I teach math classes now at Victor Valley College in addition to teaching astronomy, as does my husband. And I teach the math classes as I learned them more than 40 years ago without having thought about how they were taught to me since. It just seems like I remember exactly how they were taught to me as I remember Star Trek. I was fearless as a young person at high school age. I wanted exploration even if it meant astronaut training and ultimately one day giving my life to that exploration. I would always remember the episodes of Star Trek where the dangers were great. Even shore leave or rest was associated with danger on distant worlds, vacation thoughts or relaxation thoughts might come alive on some world like in the Star Trek original series episode of shore leave. Danger was ever present in exploration. My hero characters in Star Trek often had their lives at stake in encountering alien life forms and their worlds. But it was worth it to advance the cause of respect for life throughout the universe, to understand that life, to take our place in this universe as productive members who wanted to learn the secrets of the universe and of the science that explained its evolution and perhaps ours. As in the 2009 Star Trek movie, did I have a Captain Pike in my life who believed in me and felt that I was destined for Starfleet? You bet I did. His name was Gibson Reeves, and I don't know, it's a different county, University of Southern California, I don't know how many of you might have been blessed to meet Gibson, but he was a remarkable professor of astronomy. He's pictured here with his, his wife and uh, Mary and his son Benjamin. Um, Gibson was the former department chairman of the University of Southern California, Department of Astronomy. Gibson passed away in 2005. He was an astronomer of the highest caliber. His specialty was dwarf galaxies, and he ultimately discovered that some drawings made by Leonardo da Vinci were of the moon and were so accurate that they could be used as dated observations to refine the libration of the moon. But Gibson loved all aspects of astronomy, and he loved teaching it. He once told me that when he was teaching about Kepler's laws of planetary motion, he only wanted two people in the room, Kepler and the student. And he made sure that it happened that way. He shunned the spotlight in favor of his students at the University of Southern California Department of Astronomy, which he and another accomplished astronomer founded, Dr. John Russell. Together, they changed the lives of students like me, eager to contribute to the field. And back then, what was Starfleet Academy? It was as it is now. Every academic university in the world where students can advance their knowledge to ultimately contribute to exploration. And apparently, at the time, I was the top student in the academy. I was given a teaching assistantship as an undergraduate at USC, which is quite a rarity. Um, who did I view myself as? Perhaps a future star, starship captain yet? Perhaps, I never dreamed, I really never dreamed that one character's life would play out so much like my own to an unimaginable degree. I admired the Vulcan Spock, that conflicted half human, half Vulcan, who never quite belonged in either world of his Starfleet comrades or the world of Vulcan. And what was the equivalent of an assignment to a starship our nation definitely had goals then for manned exploration, but when Gibson placed his calls to, to clear a path for me into exploration, which he very much deemed that I had earned, um, he called Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The University of Southern California used the Stony Ridge Observatory for its students, and USC Astronomy was contracted to take some plates of the Jovian satellites um, for use in the ephemeris development of the moons, refining the orbits of the moons of Jupiter because they were going to be used in the navigation process of Ju uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 at Jupiter. The year was 1973 when Gibson made those phone calls. Voyager 1 would not encounter Jupiter for six more years. I could never have dreamed that this tie of JPL to USC would result in the career I was about to launch on. 
what was it like at JPL in the halls of that starship assigned to a particular mission? Indeed, were there navigation people? Were there science officers? Were there helmsmen? And a commander? And absolutely, there were all of those things for every mission. And what exactly was it like to walk in those halls? Imagine, if you will, a place dedicated to exploration and indeed um, over the months of January and February of 1979, the image of Jupiter gaining higher and higher resolution as Voyager 1 got closer and closer to this gigantic world. And I, I know that you realize that that is the great red spot and that several Earths could fit within the diameter of that one storm that has been raging for hundreds of years on Jupiter. Imagine seeing the monitors that are just there because that is the place that you had entered and had earned the right to be there. Imagine that these images of Jupiter were only background where your specific work had to be done. Seeing things that had never been seen before, just as you're on your way to do your job, you're almost too busy to notice. Just as in a starship and the view from the Enterprise windows as they travel through space. My work was navigation specifically optical navigation using the images of the large moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto against a star background in order to determine the position of the spacecraft with respect to those moons. It is a spacecraft-based data type. The camera is on the spacecraft. This was the Voyager navigation team at Jupiter and Saturn. Optical navigation data was combined with radiometric data taken from Earth and Earth-based data type to produce the navigation solutions that went into the spacecraft trajectory correction maneuvers. So we were navigating very far from home. It's been, it's been equated, the accomplishment of the navigation team, to threading a needle out at the distance of Jupiter, and that is exactly what we did, and I am truly honored to be a part of that team. Over the six years before Voyager 1 encountered Jupiter, though, I had plenty of science and engineering adventures over those six years. That's a shadow um, of our moon on Earth, and I'll tell you how it relates. I had, um, in 1977, I was selected as a co-guest investigator on the Viking Extended Mission to Mars. The Viking mission had two landers at different locations on the surface of Mars and two orbiters orbiting the planet. I utilized all four spacecraft in an experiment to use the shadows of the moons of Phobos and Deimos to pinpoint the location of the landers on the surface of Mars to a higher degree of accuracy than could be otherwise obtained. And I don't have as any colorful pictures of the shadows of the moons on Mars on that surface as I do on Earth moons on the uh, Earth moons, Earth's moon on the surface of Earth. But this picture will definitely give you the idea of how we utilize the moons passing over the landers with orbiter pictures and the, and the precise timing as the landers got dark to find out where they were on that surface when they were beneath the resolution of anything that we could see. But um, indeed, this is Mars as we saw it through Vikings' eyes the red planet at closest approach to us, 46 million miles away. This is the Viking II lander, what it saw at a place called Utopia Planitia on Mars, a region of fractured planes. And I don't know about you, but when I see that surface, that is a place that I would like to walk on. I would like to walk on Mars and to talk on Mars. I would like to go. Take a look at this breathtaking sunset on Mars over Chrysi Planitia, pictured by Viking Lander 1. I visited remote places for the lab, not quite as remote as Mars during that time, and worked on many of the requirements um, for the Voyager navigation until becoming cognizant over the optical navigation image processing system for Voyager in 1978. I published internal memorandum that were related to this work, wrote and contributed to many science journals, and gave presentations at science conferences. I did remote work at Lick Observatory, producing the star catalog. We, we, there were no star catalogs that existed 
anywhere in the world that were accurate enough to the precision of the work that we had to do for Voyager. So I had to create my own star catalog. The plates were taken at Lick Observatory. Um, I was instrumental in telling their, um, their um, plate reduction system which stars to process. There's 5,000 stars in that catalog. Um, and indeed, though I did ultimately, I never, never dreamed that I would become cognizant engineer over that optical navigation image extraction when I did. And I was very honored to serve in this crucial capacity for Voyager navigation. But I was not a member of the science team, OK? That would be the equivalent of the science officers on Star Trek when I saw this. And this is something you've seen earlier today. And I think um, the image that, that Chris had up there was indeed much more like what I saw. This one is even slightly more processed. It wasn't much to go on there. But what I saw was a large object off the edge of Io in one of my pictures taken for optical navigation. And it's very, very hard to see. But there's an, an anomaly there, extremely large, with respect to the radius of Io, about 270 kilometers above the surface of Io. But even Believing that it had anything to do with the surface is something that's very, very hard to imagine. It's so large. When I noticed something strange in an image of Io taken for navigation after Voyager encountered Jupiter, it would be as if navigator Pavel Chekhov had seen it. By not being Spock in the mission, I became Spock. I was out of place by not being a member of the science imaging team and ultimately making the largest discovery of the planetary exploration program. Nothing like this had ever happened before at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In a sense that someone who was not a member of the science team and working in the capacity of uh, as an engineer, a senior engineer, um, finds something. Never happened before in their history. I have found a geologically alive world on Io. Here is a moon of Jupiter that Voyager showed us. This is Io's on the left. It's Io's eastern hemisphere and its western hemisphere. And you can see the large heart-shaped feature. And indeed, not even Star Trek has shown us anything stranger than this world. Forget tribbles for oddities. Io is indeed like a moldy pizza, as it was said earlier. Unlike all other bodies of our solar system known to us at the time, Io is even far more volcanically active than our own Earth, a new class of worlds whose volcanism stems from tidal heating. I was half engineer, half scientist, and tried to imagine what it might be like to be that engineer who made the largest discovery ever to come out of JPL and to have done it as Chekhov. I became the scientist that the Voyager mission did not know they had. And why did I made this, make this discovery when none of the mission scientists whose job it was to make such a huge find? They missed it. Why did they? I would like to read from National Geographic's article about my discovery published in 1980. The excitement was subsiding at Jet Propulsion Laboratory on Friday, March 9th, when Linda Morabito made her discovery. Most members of the Voyager imaging team, exhausted by days and nights of nonstop encounter with Jupiter, were taking the long weekend off, but Morabito was at work. She used her computer to exaggerate the brightness of the star on her screen. As she did, a great umbrella-shaped plume emerged off the edge of Io. I'd never seen anything like this before. I, I suspected no one else had either, she recalled. Indeed, as National Geographic wrote, not since Galileo saw four moons orbiting, circling Jupiter in 1610 had anyone seen such a remarkable sight in Jupiter's realm. Moravito knew that an active volcano on Io could be the greatest find of the planetary exploration program. And by my own account. I was alone in the room with the image of Io and the anomaly. I sensed the significance of what was in this room. I knew I had something here. I knew it was important. I sensed that I was seeing something that no human being had ever seen before. So how did I do this? 
How did I determine what large unidentifiable object, the unidentifiable object was it that the one that we've looked at in the picture of Io? Who did I consult? Was there any intrigue? Wh how, what was Spock treated like, as you might imagine? Welcome with this new find or fought? How well was Galileo Galilei treated when he made his discovery of Io itself in 1610? What Star Trek episode can you see to tell you this? What movie can you go to? As of November of last year, you can finally read my account of my discovery in my memoir. After more than 30 years, I have finally told the discovery story. Why is this so significant? What I found is this. One of many active volcanoes spewing sulfur dioxide snow off the surface of Io, and umbrella-like plumes erupting in explosive volcanism above the surface. This picture was taken by a subsequent mission to, to Jupiter called Galileo. I had discovered that a moon in orbit around Jupiter was geologically alive, not a dead world of craters like our moon. Nothing like it had ever been seen in space before. I had found a new class of worlds from which geologic activity arises because they are caught in a gravitational tug of war between worlds. They are heated by something called tidal forces and ever so far from the sun, they bring warmth. In the case of Io, fire and brimstone. No other world besides Earth was known to be geologically alive at the time. Io was far more volcanically active than the Earth, and I think what that actually means is that one eruption on the surface of Io has more power than all of the eruptions that are taking place on Earth combined. Okay, like Spock, in his time, I became known throughout the world. Time Magazine noted that my discovery appeared simultaneously on the covers of National Geographic, Scientific American, and Smithsonian all in January of 1980, including a publication that came out at the same time in China. I received many honors that included um, having an asteroid named for me by the International Astronomical Union, becoming part of JPL's history, um, speaking with President Ronald Reagan's advisor, Edwin Mises' entourage at JPL, and that picture got into JPL's history, which is very, very exciting. So what does the person who ends up as a science officer sir, on the Jupiter leg of the mission do after that? She goes to work at the Planetary Society, which I did do for seven years as their manager of program development. I also worked for the Lewis Center for Educational Research on the Juno mission to Jupiter, the Spitzer Space Telescope, Ames Research Center's LCROSS mission, which crashed the Centaur rocket, into the moon not too long ago, and ultimately to becoming an associate professor of astronomy at Victor Valley College, caring about the next generation. So does the story end there? Did Star Trek end there? No. I'd like to refresh your memory just a little bit on the theme of the Star Trek movie in 2009, and if you saw that movie, you know it's complicated. So. We'll try to go through it a little bit. Star date 2387, a star goes supernova and threatens the home planet of the Romulans, and that is Kepler's supernova right there, as seen um, by the great telescopes, uh, Spitzer, Hubble, and Chandra. Spock, who is many more years old than 150 at that time, tells the Romulans he will save their home planet from the supernova. A ship is developed with them, something they call red matter, to form a black hole into which the supernova explosion can be absorbed and contained. However, Spock is too late to save the Romulan's home planet, and the supernova explosion destroys it. Spock uses the red matter in the ship to form the black hole, however, because the supernova threatens to destroy a lot more of the galaxy than just the entire planet but he falls under attack from Captain Nero. And Captain Nero is a Romulan who just witnessed the destruction of his entire planet. Nero's mining ship and Spock's 
equipped with red matter actually fall into the black hole that Spock created because Nero is very, very angry. And he pursues Spock and unexpectedly they both fall into the black hole. First to fall in is Captain Nero and he emerges in time 154 years before that event and destroys a Federation starship the moment he runs across it. He is ruthless because of his hatred and anger, to, anger against what he perceives Spock did, or do, did not do to save his planet. He must wait another 25 years for Spock to emerge from the black hole. And in general relativity, there is a reason for that. Spock's clock, or the way he measures time, slows down in the presence of a huge gravitational field like a black hole. What is only seconds for Spock as he falls through the black hole are 25 years for the evil Nero, and he uses this time to plan his revenge on every world in the Federation, most of all Spock's home planet. But at the moment Nero arrives 154 years into the past, he changes all the future from that moment on. What changes? Just years before, a little boy on Vulcan was growing up, half Vulcan and half human. As we all know, he went on to become the science officer of the Enterprise with his parents becoming part of a couple of Enterprise's adventures. But the new future that is created sees Spock's mother dead on star date 2258, murdered by Captain Nero, along with the destruction of his entire home planet of Vulcan. Once Nero captures Spock emerging from the black hole, he uses the capability of Spock's ship to destroy Vulcan, and Spock watches helplessly as his home planet is destroyed. Spock's mother does not live, and his father in this new future can experience emotion, which is impossible for a Vulcan, but he can. These things are changed. Kirk's life as he saw it in the series is altered too as we saw it, as we enjoyed it. His father dies just as his mother is giving birth to him, killed by Nero as Nero emerges from the black hole back in time. So the Kirk who knew his father would never exist. Only the Kirk who lost his father at his birth would exist in this new reality. By Nero and Spot going back in time, so many things changed including an entire world being eliminated by this upsetting cause and effect. And most interesting of all, Spock traveled back in time to a time when he was a young commander on the Enterprise dealing with the loss of his entire home planet pitted against Nero. Spock and the younger Spock coexist now at the same time. One is in the prime of his youth as a commander of the Enterprise and one is more than a century old. The life that I have described to you, my own, as I made so many of my dreams come true in working for JPL on site for, near, for nearly a decade, contracting with them otherwise for another decade, actually handling the largest of their outreach efforts ever accomplished at the Planetary Society. That is the life that I lived before going back in time. It took Spock 25 years to exit the black hole to the past behind Nero. It would take me nearly seven years to the return to the events of 1954 through 1956 of my life. And I'm sure you're thinking right now that it wasn't my memoir, the story of my discovery, or the story of my life that I am here to talk about today, but a science fiction that I wrote. But to the contrary. In 1967, a young psychologist was walking along one day and thinking about Spock. Her name is Francine Shapiro. She had always been interested in the adventures of Spock in Star Trek because Spock did not display emotion in the original Star Trek, and she was very interested in emotion. She noticed that when she was thinking about disturbing thoughts, her eyes would move rapidly back and forth in her head, and I am a true scientist and a true Christian, believing that God created an old universe that is as complex and as glorious as what we observe in science and in our lives. 
I think, however, scientists and explorers walking in their midst, who plays with teddy bears with six-inch fangs and a Christian in their midst. What could possibly be more alienation and be more between worlds? Live long and prosper. Think about it. Think how possibly ostracized and held up to, Chris, to criticism a scientist who is a Christian might be in today's world. I am Spock. I do not go through the ritual of Kolinar, but I do go through communion. Those are my beliefs. Once journeyed back through time, nothing could any longer be predicted with any certainty, just as in the 2009 Star Trek movie, my entire life rewritten. I did not return without proof, however, from my journey through time. From a never-before-seen world, examined by a doctor at the request of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police just last year, the first wound inflicted by my mother upon me as a child was bound on my body exactly where I remember being stabbed by her at less than the age of one. I have, see, I have seen worlds at the edge of space in my work and at the edge of time in my life. And although my explorations in my life have included the most difficult duty a person could ever do in the last seven years of my life, remembering what happened to me, I have emerged with a profound faith and am now nearly free of the damage of the past. How can Star Trek characters accept the changes that Nero and Spock caused by going back in time? How can Kirk accept that he would never, never know his father as he did, would have otherwise, if his father had not been killed at the time of his birth? They can accept, and they do accept, as I have. I never really knew my parents, but now I understand them. And I understand and have learned enough to know that this was just one life. Does that break the analogy that I came here to propose to you? Remember Spock the older who came back through time and Spock the younger um, ha having this destiny changed as he moves through those same identical years now exist together in the same time. The analogy is not broken in my estimation. She and I do exist at the same time now. I am, was simply unaware of her for 50 years. Even now, I do learn from her. She is but a small child who has been to the edges of our comprehension of space and time. Please do listen to a review of my book, Parallel Universes, a memoir from the edges of space and time, posted on Amazon.com. And this, was, this review happened to be made by a High Desert Astronomical Society member, of which I am a member, and my husband Dave is president, who saw my, my presentation on this material. She read the book. She, she writes, how is it that some people are made stronger by adversity while others fold up and blame the world for all obstacles they encounter on their journey through life? This is the story of an accomplished professional astronomer who endured torture and adversity before she could spell either and went on to become a world-respected discoverer in her field of expertise. What a horrendous, sad, and terrifying early childhood from which this woman emerged so triumphantly. And indeed, she writes, I couldn't bear, the book took me in immediately, I couldn't bear to put it down. Yet I dreaded the horrors which may be revealed on the next page. I was swept up in the moment of each discovery, both the scientific and the personal, by the unstilted conversational style of the author. This piece is an easy read filled with pathos and triumph in a word, bravo. And I hope that you will indeed live long and prosper and begin this year by reading Parallel Universes a memoir from the edges of space and time. And we would like to talk to you about that later if you wanted to come down and were interested in getting a copy of the book. And I want to thank you all for inviting me here today to speak.
I would like to take some questions from the audience, whether they be science or whether they be on any other subject. Uh, please do feel free to ask a question. Yes, Matthew. The exploits of? Indeed. Yes. Um, the question that Matthew is, is posing is um, what changes happened to the, the unmanned space exploration program as a result of my discovery? And I can tell you that they are significant. They, um, it's an amazing thing. Um, the, I always say that the discovery did not affect me, it did not in any way change me. Um, it, the significance of the discovery to science is the only thing that mattered to me. And however, it did change a lot of other people. Um, there is something that I read about recently in a NASA history called the Morabito Factor. The Morabito Factor. And the Morabito Factor is you don't let anybody look at your data if you are on a science team. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not a navigation engineer. And indeed, that, that came into play, however, on a, on a very serious context. I don't think any of us can express fully our love and appreciation of the Hubble mission and what it has shown us. But during the talks in, with, the, with um, the congressmen and the senators to get funding for the Hubble mission, the Morabito factor came up. And the scientists were not thrilled about others seeing their data before they did. And that almost killed Hubble, but don't please, I didn't mean to do that. That is not something. But a lot of the structure of the missions has changed. And um, my background, because of teachers that I had along the way, Gibson Reeves, just set me, set me straight in order to know what to do. Uh, Gibson always talked about Jocelyn Bell, always, always about her discovery of pulsars. And I don't know if you're aware of that history, but in 1967, at the University of Cambridge in England, a young woman saw something anomalous in her data. And she went to her thesis advisor, um, Sir um, Anthony Hewish, and showed it to him and said, there's something anomalous going on here. What is that? And he told her it was nothing and to ignore it. And she went on to make the discovery of pulsars. And um, what Gibson taught me, and I was privileged to have learned, was that uh, Sir Anthony Hewish received the Nobel Prize in good part for the discovery of pulsars, which he did not make. Jocelyn Bell made it. And in fact, at the time of her discovery, he told her to ignore the squiggles in her data. And as you will read in Parallel Universes, that is exactly what happened to me. But I was ready for that. Go ahead. That, that's an excellent question, and indeed, it stems, there's a couple of things that come to mind. The first is the reason that we had to create a star catalog was when you applied the proper motions of the stars from the, the previous epochs of the catalogs that existed, the error was simply too great. So we took care of the, all the epoch problems by just observing the stars as they were in the same, virtually within the same year or two of the pictures that we planned. So that took care of that problem where the positions of the stars were. Where the positions of the satellites of Jupiter were was an extremely, extremely difficult problem. And observations of Jupiter were taking place, those moons 
we're all over the world, including at USC, to refine our knowledge of the orbits of the satellites. If I can just depart just for a moment, I wanted to say and share with you that it's not just the navigation trajectory solutions that you're after. You are also after a refinement of the orbits of the very things that you're using for the navigation and for Jupiter itself. It's kind of like a catch-22, so you nail one down, and what you do is you have your predicted locations which are computed, you have your observed things that the spacecraft actually sees. The spacecraft doesn't care what you computed. It's there. It sees what it's going to see. It sees the true position. It knows where it is. We just don't know where it is. So what you do is you minus the observed, minus the computed, and you do some fancy uh, math with partial differential equations, and you solve for first the location of the spacecraft to the very best of your knowledge to that point, and second, you solve to improve the, improve the orbits. Okay. And go ahead, please. Yes, and, and, and that's an excellent point. And I, I don't know if I follow through and mention the question related to how the timing, how, how careful timing was um, created so that errors were not introduced. And indeed, it was all done in computers that are less powerful than any computer sitting on your child's desk at home doing homework. And my entire optical navigation image extraction program set that did the image processing and found the high accuracy centers of these images so we could do that process that I described earlier to you was a mini computer, but it took up an entire room. And the air would blast from below because it was so cold in there. You have to put on three sweaters and the noise, and I got used to it. I, that's where I worked. But that was a mini computer back then. Yeah. Precisely, precisely. I had the first electrical interface where I could, it was, I think it was 1,200 baud or 1,400 baud, where I could actually receive a file from the mainframe Univac 1108 on my ModComp mini computer, and oh, we thought we were something. We could send a file across, and that was the first time it was probably ever done. And then I would find the image locations and send that file back to the Univac 1108, and that's how my work was done, and it, it was, that was, that was big stuff at the time. I actually had a joystick, too. It's just, you know, kids, nowadays that is not really very novel. But back then, I, I used, in a registration process for predicted locations, I had what those pictures were supposed to look like, and I could just joystick them onto the observations and find those differences for the navigation solutions. So in, de in terms of the timing, timing, all of the, timing is not the only thing that you're, you have to make coordinate system transformations for. Those were all algorithms where we could go from celestial locations out in space down to the Earth and down to what we would actually be receiving from the spacecraft. And those system coordinates transformations are just, we had to model everything, including everything that could affect the timing, including everything that could affect the position, including everything that could affect and, or error in the data. It was all modeled, all modeled in advance. And so those were algorithms that people labored over to get exact and precise. And it is a team effort. Thousands of people were responsible for that success and for every success that you see in space. It is no one individual. And so that is in, all of that is modeled. But I will tell you that at the time of the when I came in on March 9, 1979, to look at the data that Voyager, and it was for a low priority, just a trajectory, all of the navigation was done. We were, the final trajectory correction maneuvers had been, um, had been sent to the spacecraft to send it towards Saturn and to, on its way to Saturn, that I had, um, I was doing post-encounter satellite ephemeris development, exactly what I described to you to improve the orbits of the moons of Jupiter. And it's low priority work. But when I came in, that's what I was doing, and that's when I saw the anomaly in the um, image. It was after the encounter, after every scientist, almost all of them had gone home, and there was, everybody was just completely and totally exhausted. So there was a battle against myself because I really couldn't think two thoughts in a row at that point. And just to, to, you're seeing something that has never been seen before, and you sense that, and you're so tired you don't know what you can possibly do next. So all of that was taking place, but there was a timing problem, precisely what you're referring to. After the spacecraft got back, 
got past the planet, there was some kind of a timing problem that developed. And that got my attention for a long time. I, I had to divert my attention because I didn't want to have introduced any errors into our navigation solution. And I had noticed that on one previous optical navigation image. So there was a timing problem on that spacecraft that took place after the encounter, fortunately. And we made absolutely certain it did not affect earlier our, our, our navigation solution. But all of that is modeled in algorithms. Um, the intricacies, every, I don't know if it's even imaginable how many people work and how many hours they work to make this magic happen in space exploration. And I think the things, I think for the first time, what I'm seeing throughout the world is that people are becoming involved with image processing, with an observational astronomy to a level that has brought it to the average person, to where I think there really is an appreciation now for what it takes to accomplish exploration. And it's a very exciting time in astronomy when the whole world responds to new developments that we were, were you mentioned earlier. The discovery, you can't keep up with them anymore. And that's the way it should be, and that's what we need to inspire our young people to those kinds of education so they can create those algorithms. We are sorely lacking in this country in that area. And it's a very high priority for myself and my husband to educate the next generation. Yes. I, I think it's just a matter of time that they're all going that way. And there are people who are, who are not involved directly in the space program who are doing image processing and making discoveries now. In fact, the shadows that I showed you, that experiment that I did recently, a, a amateur astronomer, an enthusiast, was looking at images of Mars from Viking and found the shadows and created a movie. It was on the Planetary Society's website. So all of that data is becoming available. And if you'll give me, I can, I can transmit that information if you want to talk to me later in terms of if you give me your email address, we can put you on to some of that. There are whole groups of people who spend their time doing nothing, not only processing old data, but there's so much data from spacecraft now that people who are looking for supernova, for example, are just asking the public to become involved, just very much like the Planetary Society's SETI at home. So many other missions are going that direction. There's too much data for any one group of science people to, you know, tens of thousands of pictures from missions. And, in, and the resolution is so excellent now, like on the, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the, the resolution is so incredible and the size of these pictures so large that from all of these missions, you're going to get more data than they could possibly, any, in one lifetime, one person could, could process. So there's a lot of those efforts going on, and there's a particular website I'll share with you. Okay. Yes? Interesting, yes. It's interesting, and, and the question pertains to what, yeah, what, whether or not this is a fair thing to do when really the public funds the missions, and this is, this is really public domain stuff, and you, you have to wonder that the, 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 the data is not released. And uh, let me just tell you, I can't speak to other scientists, but I can certainly speak for myself. When I saw something anomalous in an image of, of, of Io, the one thing I wanted to make absolutely certain of, because I love astronomy so much, is that I would never love astronomy less. 
So I fought, not for the credit, but I fought for the history to be preserved, but I also fought for my love of astronomy. I didn't, I knew what could happen, and I didn't want to love astronomy less. And I wanted to make absolutely certain that the history was preserved. And I can thank an educator for bringing to my attention, through an example in history, that particular need um, that I needed, I needed to be aware of what could happen. And it, it's not just that it would happen to me or to Jocelyn Bell. I mean, look at what happened to Galileo. All of those, the lessons of history are such that there is a resistance to new ideas and, of course, an incredible, an incredible competition. I mean, look at, look at um, Kepler and Tycho Brahe. I mean, my gosh. Just, um, it's, it, has, it didn't start now, but it continues now. And you are correct. The science investigators do want to hang on to their data and make their finds. And I understood when I was speaking to someone on the Cassini mission, and, I, and I, I can't say that this is a fact, but I will share with you that I was told that the entire structure of the data system coming back from Cassini uh, was based on, on me. The entire, from end to end. And that's um, interesting. <laughs> right. Okay, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, basically, yes. You will find, as I write about my life, I, I have been fortunate, very, very fortunate, to be able to tell the people that I have considered heroes personally to their faces that, um, that they, are, they are people I really admire and respect. When I was a very young student at the University of Southern California, I went to a talk given by Ray Bradbury, and it had quite an effect on me. And many, many years later, in working for the Planetary Society and working with Ray, I was able to tell him the effect that it had on me. And he remembered the exact day and the exact talk. And you can see the light bulb go off in his eyes. So when he found out that I had written my memoir, he was, he was, he was um, very, very graciously agreed to write a note for me. And, and, and not only that, but I, there's some, a little bit of artwork by uh, William Hartman in the book, and um, one of a kind uh, photographs that, that I, and data products that are also in the book. And it, it, the book is a unique mix. It really is a journey through space and time. And I love the science questions totally, but amazingly enough, on the other aspect of, the, of my journey, as a scientist reporting back, I usually find at least one person per presentation who asks for the type of help that I was given to overcome the things that I had to be, um, overcome. So on all fronts, I think the book is worthwhile. That's primarily why I wrote it. I don't think most people would share um, a past of that nature, but I cannot tell you the level of advancement that psychology has apparently experienced, not just astronomy, this is a quantum leap, and I greatly benefited from it. I don't think I would have survived without it. So, some good stuff. Yes? Were your children um, interested in science as you were? My son was always, always interested in science, but he was far, he's far more practical than I. And he, he has a love and understanding of it, and he, and he shares that with our grandchildren. But he, um, his, his field was actually care for the elderly. That is a lot different. So he's a lot different than I am. And I always encourage young people to reach their potentials. I don't care what field it's in, but it is our responsibility and our job to give them that chance and that opportunity. That's, that's the number one priority. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, please come down and, and speak with us some more. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Have my notes. Thank you.